Chapter 7, Part 6 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 7, Differences in Spelling, Part 6, Minor Differences various minor differences remain to be noticed one is a divergence in orthography due to differences in pronunciation specialty aluminum and alarm offer examples in english they are speciality aluminium and alarum though alarm is also an alternative form specialty in america is always accented on the first syllable speciality in england on the third the result is two distinct words though their meaning is identical how aluminium in america lost its fourth syllable i have been unable to determine but all american authorities now make it aluminum and all english authorities stick to aluminium another difference in usage is revealed in the spelling and pluralization of foreign words such words when they appear in an english publication even a newspaper almost invariably bear the correct accent but in the united states it is almost as invariably the rule to omit these accents save in publications of considerable pretensions this is notably the case with cafe crepe Debut, débutante, potier, levé, éclat, fête, régime, rôle, soirée, protégé, élite, mêlée, tête à tête, and répertoire. It is rare to encounter any of them with its proper accents in an American newspaper. It is rare to encounter them unaccented in an English newspaper this slaughter of the accents it must be obvious greatly aids the rapid naturalization of a newcomer it loses much of its foreignness at once and is thus easier to absorb depot would have been a long time working its way into american had it remained depot but immediately it became plain depot it got in the process is constantly going on i often encounter naivete without its accent and even deschabille hofbrau seigneur and resume canyon was changed to canyon c a n y o n years ago and the cases of expose divorce schmierkas employe and matinee are familiar at least one american dignitary of learning brander matthews has openly defended and even advocated this clipping of accents in speaking of naif and naivete which he welcomes because we have no exact equivalent for either word he says but they will need to shed their accents and to adapt themselves somehow to the traditions of our orthography he goes on after we have decided that the foreign word we find knocking at the doors of english he really means american as the context shows is likely to be useful we must fit it for naturalization by insisting that it shall shed its accents if it has any that it shall change its spelling if this is necessary that it shall modify its pronunciation if this is not easy for us to compass and that it shall conform to all our speech habits especially in the formation of the plural footnote i once noted an extreme form of this naturalization in a leading southern newspaper the baltimore sun in an announcement of the death of an american artist it reported that he had studied at the beaux-arts in paris in new york i have also encountered chauffeur c h a u f e r End footnote. in this formation of the plural as elsewhere english regards the precedence and 
American makes new ones. All the English authorities that I have had access to advocate retaining the foreign plurals of most of the foreign words in daily use. Example, sanatoria, appendices, virtuosi, formulae, and libretti. But American usage favors plurals of native cut. And the Journal of the American Medical Association goes so far as to approve curriculums and septums. Banditi, in place of bandits, would seem an affectation in America, and so would soprani for sopranos, and soli for solos. Footnote. Now and then, of course, a contrary tendency asserts itself. For example, the plural of medium, in the sense of advertising medium, is sometimes made media by advertising men. End footnote. The last two are common in England. Both English and American labor under the lack of native plurals for the two everyday titles Mr. and Mrs. In the written speech and in the more exact forms of the spoken speech, the French plurals Monsieur and Madame are used, but in the ordinary spoken speech, at least in America, they are avoided by circumlocution. When monsieur has to be spoken, it is almost invariably pronounced mesers, and in the same way, mesdames becomes mesdames, with the first syllable rhyming with says, and the second, which bears the accent, with games. In place of mesdames, a more natural form, madams, seems to be gaining ground in America. Thus I lately found Dame du Sacré-Cœur translated as Madams of the Sacred Heart in a Catholic paper of wide circulation, and the form is apparently used by American members of the community. In capitalization, the English are a good deal more conservative than we are. They invariably capitalize such terms as government, prime minister, and society, when used as proper nouns. They capitalize press, pulpit, bar, etc., almost as often. In America, a movement against this use of capitals appeared during the latter part of the 18th century. In Jefferson's first draft of the Declaration of Independence, nature and creator and even God are in lower case. During the twenties and thirties of the succeeding century, probably as a result of French influence, the disdain of capitals went so far that the days of the week were often spelled with small initial letters, and even Mr. capital M-R became Mr. lowercase M-R. Curiously enough, the most striking exhibition of this tendency of late years is offered by an English work of the highest scholarship, the Cambridge History of English Literature. It uses the lower case for all titles, even baron and colonel, before proper names, and also avoids capitals in such words as Presbyterian, Catholic, and Christian, and in the second parts of such terms as Westminster Abbey and Atlantic Ocean. Finally, there are certain differences in punctuation. The English, as everyone knows, put a comma after the street number of a house, making it, for example, 34, comma, St. James Street. They usually insert a comma instead of a period after the hour when giving the time in figures, example, 9, comma, 27, and omit the O, when indicating less than ten minutes. Example, 8, 7, instead of 8.07. They do not use the period as the mark of the decimal, but employ a dot at the level of the upper dot of a colon, as in 3.1416. They cling to the hyphen in such words as today and tonight it begins to disappear in america they use an before hotel and historical k 
Kipling has even used it before hydraulic. American usage prefers A, but these small differences need not be pursued further. End of Chapter 7, Part 6 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 8, Part 1 of The American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 8, Proper Names in America Part 1, Surnames a glance at any American city directory is sufficient to show that, despite the continued political and cultural preponderance of the original English strain, the American people have quite ceased to be authentically English in race, or even authentically British. The blood in their arteries is inordinately various and inextricably mixed, but yet not mixed enough to run a clear stream. A touch of foreignness still lingers about millions of them even in the country of their birth they show their alien origin in their speech in their domestic customs in their habits of mind and in their very names just as the scotch and the welsh have invaded england elbowing out the actual english to make room for themselves so the irish the germans the italians the scandinavians and the jews of eastern europe and in some areas the french the slavs and the hybrid spaniards have elbowed out the descendants of the first colonists it is not exaggerating indeed to say that wherever the old stock comes into direct and unrestrained conflict with one of these new stocks it tends to succumb or at all events to give up the battle the irish in the big cities of the east attained to a truly impressive political power long before the first native-born generation of them had grown up footnote the great irish famine which launched the chief emigration to america extended from eighteen forty five to eighteen forty seven the know nothing movement which was chiefly aimed at the irish extended from eighteen fifty two to eighteen sixty end footnote the Germans, following the limestone belt of the Allegheny foothills, preempted the best lands east of the mountains before the new republic was born. And so, in our own time, we have seen the Swedes and Norwegians shouldering the native from the wheat lands of the northwest, and the Italians driving the decadent New Englanders from their farms, and the Jews gobbling New York and the slavs getting a firm foothold in the mining regions and the french canadians penetrating new hampshire and vermont and the japanese and portuguese menacing hawaii and the awakened negroes gradually ousting the whites from the farms of the south the birth rate among all these foreign stocks is enormously greater than among the older stock and though the death rate is also high the net increase remains relatively formidable. Even without the aid of immigration, it is probable that they would continue to rise in numbers faster than the original English and so-called Scotch-Irish. Turn to the letter Z in the New York Telephone Directory, and you will find a truly astonishing array of foreign names, some of them in process of Anglicization, but many of them still arrestingly outlandish. The only Anglo-Saxon surname beginning with Z is Zacharias, and even that was originally borrowed from the Greek. To this the Norman invasion seems to have added only Zushi. But in Manhattan and the Bronx, even among the necessarily limited class of telephone subscribers, there are nearly 1,500 persons whose names begin with the letter, and among them one finds fully 150 different surnames. The German Zimmermann, with either one N or two, is naturally the most numerous single name, and following close upon it 
are its derivatives, Zimmer and Zimmern. With them are many more German names, Zahn, Zeckendorf, Zeffert, Zeitler, Zeller, Zellner, Zeltmacher, Zepp, Ziegfeld, Zabel, Zucker, Zuckermann, Ziegler, Zillman, Zinser, and so on. They are all represented heavily, but they indicate neither the earliest nor the most formidable accretion, for underlying them are many Dutch names, example Zeeman and Zumand, and over them are a large number of Slavic, Italian, and Jewish names. Among the first I note Zabludowski, Zabriski, Zaksinski, Zapinkow, Zaretsky, Zeknovich, Zenzalski, and Zivachevsky. Among the second, Zakardi, Zakarini, Zakaro, Zapparano, Zanelli, Zicarelli, and Zuka. Among the third, Zukor, Zipkin, and Ziskind. There are two various Spanish names, Zelaya, Zingaro, etc., and Greek, Zapion, Zervakos, and Zuvelekis, and Armenian, Zalum, Zaron, and Zatmagian, and Hungarian, Zedek, Zegor, and Zishe, and Swedish, Zetterholm, and Zetterlund, and a number that defy placing, Zreik, Zvan, Zwipf, Zula, Zur, and Zev. Any other American telephone directory will show the same extraordinary multiplication of exotic patronymics. I choose at random that of Pittsburgh, and confine myself to the saloon keepers and clergymen. Among the former I find a great many German names. Arts, Bartels, Blum, Gertner, Dietmer, Hahn, Feil, Schumann, Schlegel, von Hedemann, Weiss, and so on. And Slavic names, Blaszkiewicz, Bukowski, Puwalowski, Krikolski, Tuladzike, and Stratkiewicz. And Greek and Italian names, Markopoulos, Martinelli, Foglia, Gigliotti, and Carabinos, and names beyond my determination, Tiberski, Volongiatica, Herisco, and Hajduk. Very few Anglo-Saxon names are on the list. The continental foreigner seems to be driving out the native, and even the Irishman, from the saloon business. Among the clerics, naturally enough, there are more men of English surname, but even here I find such strange names as Ororov, Ashinsky, Burajanis, Duik, Silo, Mazur, Privbliski, Pniak, Basilevich, Smelsch, and Vrunek. But Pittsburgh and New York, it may be argued, are scarcely American. Unrestricted immigration has swamped them. The newcomers crowd into the cities. Well, examine the roster of the National House of Representatives, which surely represents the whole country. On it, I find Bacharach, Dupre, Esch, Estopinal, Focht, Heinz, Kahn, Kies, Kreider, La Guardia, Kraus, Lazaro, Lebach, Romju, Siegel, and Zielmann, not to mention the insular delegates Calagnanole, Rivera, Davila, and Yanko, and enough Irishmen to organize a parliament at Dublin. In the New York City directory, the fourth most common name is now Murphy, an Irish name, and the fifth most common is Meyer which is German and chiefly Jewish. The Meyers are the Smiths of Austria and of most of Germany. They outnumber all other clans. After them come the Schultzes and Krauses, just as the Joneses and Williamses follow the Smiths in Great Britain. 
Schultz and Krauss do not seem to be very common names in New York, but Schmidt, Muller, Schneider, and Klein appear among the fifty commonest. Cohen and Levy rank eighth and ninth, and are both ahead of Jones, which is second in England, and Williams, which is third. Taylor, a highly typical British name, ranking fourth in England and Wales, is twenty-third in New York. Ahead of it, beside Murphy, Meyer, Cohn, and Levy, are Schmidt, Ryan, O'Brien, Kelly, and Sullivan. Robinson, which is twelfth in England, is thirty-ninth in New York. Even Schneider and Muller are ahead of it. In Chicago, Olson, Schmidt, Meyer, Hansen, and Larson are ahead of Taylor, and Hoffman and Becker are ahead of Ward. In Boston, Sullivan and Murphy are ahead of any English name save Smith. In Philadelphia, Myers is just below Robinson. Nor, as I have said, is this large proliferation of foreign surnames confined to the large cities. There are whole regions in the southwest in which Lopez and Gonzalez are far commoner names than Smith, Brown, or Jones, and whole regions in the Middle West, wherein Olson is commoner than either Taylor or Williams, and places both north and south where Duval is at least as common as Brown. Moreover, the true proportions of this admixture of foreign blood are partly concealed by a wholesale anglicization of surnames, sometimes deliberate and sometimes the fruit of mere confusion. That Smith, Brown, and Miller remain in first, second, and third places among the surnames of New York is surely no sound evidence of Anglo-Saxon survival. The German and Scandinavian Schmidt has undoubtedly contributed many a Smith, and Braun many a Brown, and Muller many a Miller. In the same way, Johnson, which holds first place among Chicago surnames, and Anderson, which holds third, are plainly reinforced from Scandinavian sources, and the former may also owe something to the Russian Ivanov. Miller is a relatively rare name in England. It is not among the fifty most common, but it stands thirtieth in Boston, fourth in New York and Baltimore, and second in Philadelphia. Footnote. It was announced by the Bureau of War Risk Insurance on March 30, 1918, that there were then 15,000 millers in the United States Army. On the same day, there were 262 John J. O'Briens, of whom 50 had wives named Mary. End footnote. In the last-named city, the influence of Muller, probably borrowed from the Pennsylvania Dutch, is plainly indicated, and in Chicago it is likely that there are also contributions from the Scandinavian Moller, the Polish Janzuski, and the Bohemian Mlinar. Myers, as we have seen, is a common surname in Philadelphia. So are Fox and Snyder. In some part, at least, they have been reinforced by the Pennsylvania Dutch Meyer, Fuchs, and Schneider. Sometimes Muller changes to Miller, sometimes to Muller, and sometimes it remains unchanged, but with the spelling made M-U-E-L-L-E-R. Muller and Mueller do not appear among the commoner names in Philadelphia. All the Mullers seem to have become Millers, thus putting Miller in second place. But in Chicago, with Miller in fourth place, there is also Mueller in thirty-first place, and in New York, with Miller in third place, there is also Muller in twenty-fourth place. Such changes, chiefly based upon transliterations, are met with in all countries. The name of Taff, familiar in Austrian history, had an Irish prototype, probably Taft. General Demikoff, one of the Russian commanders at the Battle of Zorndorf in 1758, was a Swede born 
Temikut. Franz Maria von Tugut, the Austrian diplomatist, was a member of an Italian Tyrolese family named Tunicotto. This became Tunicut, do no good, in Austria, and was changed to Tugut, do good, to bring it into greater accord with its possessor's deserts. In Bonaparte, the Italian Buono became the French Bon. Many English surnames are decayed forms of Norman French names. For example, Sydney from Saint Denis, Diver from Dever, Bridgewater from Beur de Volter, Montgomery from De Montgomery, Garnet from Garino, and Seymour from Sammore. A large number of so-called Irish names are the products of rough-and-ready transliterations of Gaelic patronymics. For example, Findlay from Fionla, Dermot from Diamud, and Maclean from McGillian. In the same way, the name of Phoenix Park in Dublin came from Fionisk, fine water. Of late, some of the more ardent Irish authors and politicians have sought to return to the originals. Thus, O'Sullivan has become O'Sullivan. Pierce has become Pierre. Mac Sweeney has become Mac Suvin. And Patrick has suffered a widespread transformation to Podre. But in America, with a language of peculiar vowel sounds and even consonant sounds struggling against a foreign invasion unmatched for strength and variety, such changes have been far more numerous than across the ocean, and the legal rule of idem sonans is of much wider utility than anywhere else in the world. If it were not for that rule, there would be endless difficulties for the wises whose grandfathers were wises and the Leonards, born Leonhards, Leonhards, or Lennarts, and the Mannies, who descend and inherit from Le Man. A crude popular etymology, says a leading authority on surnames, often begins to play upon a name that is no longer significant to the many. So, the Thurgods have become Thoroughgoods, and the Toddenackers, have become the Pennsylvania Dutch toothakers, much as asparagus has become sparrow grass. So, too, the Wittnachts of Boyle County, Kentucky, descendants of a Hollander, have become whitenecks, and the Lens of Lower Pennsylvania, descendants of some far off German, have become Lanes. Footnote Harriet Lane Johnston was of this family. End footnote. Edgar Allan Poe was a member of a family long settled in western Maryland, the founder being one Po or Pfau, a native of the Palatinate. Major George Armistead, who defended Fort McHenry in 1814 when Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner, was the descendant of an Armstadt who came to Virginia from Hesse-Darmstadt. General George A. Custer, the Indian fighter, was the great-grandson of one Custer, a Hessian soldier paroled after Burgoyne's surrender. William Wirt, anti-Masonic candidate for the presidency in 1832, was the son of one Wirt. William Paca, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, was the great-grandson of a Bohemian named Paca. General W. S. Rosencrantz was really a Rosencrantz. Even the surname of Abraham Lincoln, according to some authorities, was an anglicized form of Linkhorn. Such changes, in fact, are almost innumerable. Every work upon American genealogy is full of examples. The first foreign names to undergo the process were Dutch and French. Among the former, Riger was debased to Riker. 
Van der Veer to Van Diver, Van Hees to Van Eyes, Van Siegel to Van Sickle, Van Arsdale to Vannersdale, and Harlan or Harlem to Harlan. Among the latter, Petit became Potit. Cahier changed to Kyle. De La Haye to De La Haye. De Jean to De Chang. Guizot to Gosset. Guerillon to Caron. Soul to Sewell. Gervais to Jarvis. Bale to Bailey. Fontaine to Fountain. Denis to Denny. Pebaudier to Peabody. Bompin to Bumpus. And De L'Hôtel to Doolittle. Frenchmen and French Canadians who came to New England, says Chael de Verre, had to pay for such hospitality as they there received by the sacrifice of their names. The brave Boncourt, Captain Marriott tells us in his diary, became Mr. Bunker, and gave his name to Bunker's Hill. But it was the German immigration that provoked the first really wholesale slaughter. A number of characteristic German sounds, for example that of U and the guttural in H and G, are almost impossible to the Anglo-Saxon pharynx, and so they had to go. Thus, bloch was changed to block or black, ochs to oaks, hoch to hoch, fischbach to fishback, albrecht to albert or albright, and steinweg to steinway, and the grundwort Bach was almost universally changed to bow, as in Brumbau. The U met the same fate. Grun was changed to green, Fjör to fear or Fjör, Warner to Warner, Dürink to Deering, and Schnabele to Snavely, Snavely, or Snivelly. In many other cases, there were changes in spelling to preserve vowel sounds differently represented in German and English. Thus, Blum was changed to Bloom. Footnote. Henry Harrison, in his Dictionary of the Surnames of the United Kingdom, London, 1912, shows that such names as Bloom, Klein, etc., always represent transliterations of German names. They are unknown to genuinely British nomenclature. End footnote. Royce to Royce, Kirster to Kester, Kiele to Kiele, Schrader to Schrader, Stehli to Staley, Wehmann to Wehmann, Friedmann to Friedman. Baumann to Bowman, and Lang, as the best compromise possible, to Long. The change of Aim to Ames belongs to the same category. The addition of the final S represents a typical effort to substitute the nearest related Anglo-Saxon name. Other examples of that effort are to be found in Michaels for Michaelis, Bowers for Bower, Johnson for Johansson, Ford for Forth, Heinz for Heinz, Kemp for Kempf, Foreman for Foreman, Kuhns or Kuhns for Kuntz, Hoover for Huber, Levering for Liebering, Jones for Jonas, Swop for Schwab, Height or Hyde for Hyde, Andrews for Andre, Young for Jung, and Pence for Pence. The American antipathy to accented letters mentioned in the chapter on spelling 
is particularly noticeable among surnames an immigrant named forst inevitably becomes plain first in the united states and if not the man then surely his son lo in the same way is transformed into lo footnote i lately encountered the following sign in front of an automobile repair shop for puncture or blow bring it to low end footnote luoman into lerman schern into schon souple into supply or supply luders into luders and brul into brill even when no accent betrays it the foreign diphthong is under hard pressure thus the german ur disappears and lerb is changed to lob or laib erler to oler lurser to lesser and schern to schon or shane in the same way the au in such names as rosenau changes to aw a w so too the french o i sound is disposed of and dubois is pronounced dubois and boileau acquires a first syllable rhyming with toil so with the k n in the german names of the knapp class they are all pronounced probably by analogy with night as if they began with n so with s c h schneider becomes snyder schlegel becomes slegel and schluter becomes sluter if a foreigner clings to the original spelling of his name he must usually expect to hear it mispronounced roth in american quickly becomes roth Fremont, losing both accent and the french e becomes fremont bloom begins to rhyme with dumb mon rhymes with van and lang with hang kranz lanz and their cognates with chance kurz with shirts the first syllable of gutmann with but the first of color with bay the first of werner with turn the first of wagner with nag uller in america is always euler berg loses its german e sound for an english u sound and its german hard g for an english g it becomes identical with the berg of iceberg the same change in the vowel occurs in erdmann in koenig the german diphthong succumbs to a long o and the hard g becomes k the common pronunciation is konig often in berger the g becomes soft and the name rhymes with verger it becomes soft too in bittinger in wilstach and welsbach the ch becomes a k in anhäuser the eu changes to a long i the final e important in german is nearly always silenced dome rhymes with foam kühne becomes keen in addition to these transliterations there are constant translations of foreign proper names many a pennsylvania carpenter says dr oliphant bearing a surname that is english from the french from the latin and there a celtic loanword in origin is neither english nor french nor latin nor celt but an original german zimmermann a great many other such translations are under everyday observation fund becomes pound becker baker schumacher 
shoemaker König, king weisberg whitehill koch cook footnote koch a common german name has very hard sledding in america its correct pronunciation is almost impossible to americans at best it becomes coke hence it is often changed not only to cook but to cox coke or even cocky End footnote. Newman, Newman. Schaefer, Shepherd or Shepard. Gutmann, Goodman. Goldschmidt, Goldsmith. Edelstein, Noblestone. Steiner, Stoner. Meister, Masters. Schwartz, Black. Weiss, white weber weaver butcher booker vogelgesang bird song sontag sunday and so on partial translations are also encountered example studebaker from studebecker and rain dollar from reintaler by the same process among the newer immigrants the polish witkiewicz becomes wilson the bohemian bohumil becomes godfrey and the bohemian kova and the russian kuznetsov become smith some curious examples are occasionally encountered thus henry woodhouse a gentleman prominent in aeronautical affairs came to the united states from italy as mario terenzio enrico casaleño his new surname is simply a translation of his old one and the belmonts the bankers unable to find a euphonious english equivalent for their german jewish patronymic of schoenberg chose a french one that americans could pronounce in part as i say these changes in surname are enforced by the sheer inability of americans to pronounce certain continental consonants and their disinclination to remember the continental vowel sounds many an immigrant finding his name constantly mispronounced changes its vowels or drops some of its consonants many another shortens it or translates it or changes it entirely for the same reason just as a well-known greco french poet changed his greek name of papa diamantopoulos to moreas because Papa Diamantopoulos was too much for Frenchmen, and as an eminent Polish-English novelist changed his Polish name of Korzeniowski to Conrad, because few Englishmen could pronounce Owski correctly. So the Italian or Greek or Slav immigrant coming up for naturalization very often sheds his family name with his old allegiance and emerges as Taylor, Jackson, or Wilson i once encountered a firm of polish jews showing the name of robinson and jones on its signboard whose partners were born rubinowitz and jonas i lately heard of a german named knoche a name doubly difficult to americans what with the k n and the c h who changed it boldly to knox to avoid being called knocky a greek named Zoyopolos, Kolokotronis, Mavrokerdatos, or Constantinopolos would find it practically impossible to carry on amicable business with Americans. His name would arouse their mirth, if not their downright ire, and the same burden would lie upon a Hungarian named Benitskini, or Gialwi, or Silagi, or Vezerchilagok or a finn named kyrkesen or jaskalainen or tulensu or otnen all honorable finnish patronomics or a swede named hogrian or she or leon hufud or a bohemian named serb or rupka or for that matter a german named kaninkaisa or schnappauf 
or Fannenbecker. But more important than this purely linguistic hostility, there is a deeper social enmity, and it urges the immigrant to change his name with even greater force. For a hundred years past, all the heaviest and most degrading labor of the United States has been done by successive armies of foreigners, and so a concept of inferiority has come to be attached to mere foreignness. In addition, these newcomers, pressing upward steadily in the manner already described, have offered the native a formidable, and considering their lower standards of living, what has appeared to him to be an unfair competition on his own plane, and as a result, a hatred born of disastrous rivalry has been added to his disdain. Our unmatchable vocabulary of derisive names for foreigners reveals the national attitude. The French, Bosch, the German, Hunyade, for Hungarian. Footnote. This is army slang, but promises to survive. The Germans, during the war, had no opprobrious nicknames for their foes. The French were always die Franzosen, the English were die Englander, and so on, even when most violently abused. Even der Yankee was rare. End footnote. And the old English froggy for Frenchmen seem lone and feeble beside our great repertoire. Dago, Wop, Guinea, Kike, Goose, Mick, Harp, Bohick, Bohunk, Squarehead, Greaser, Canuck, Spigotty. Footnote. Spigotty, originating at Panama, now means a native of any Latin American region under American protection, and, in general, any Latin American. It is navy slang, but has come into extensive civilian use. It is a derisive daughter of no spick inglés. End footnote. Chink, Polak, Dutchy, Scowegian, Hunky, and Yellow Belly. This disdain tends to pursue an immigrant with extraordinary rancor when he bears a name that is unmistakably foreign and hence difficult to the native and open to his crude burlesque. Moreover, the general feeling penetrates the man himself, particularly if he be ignorant, and he comes to believe that his name is not only a handicap, but also intrinsically discreditable that it wars subtly upon his worth and integrity. Footnote. Reaction to Personal Names by Dr. C. P. Oberndorf, Psychoanalytic Review, Volume 5, Number 1, January 1918. This, so far as I know, is the only article in English which deals with the psychological effects of surnames upon their bearers. Abraham, Silberer and other German psychoanalysts have made contributions to the subject. Dr. Oberndorf alludes, incidentally, to the positive social prestige which goes with an English air, and to a smaller extent with a French air in America. He tells of an Italian who changed his patronymic of Di Pucci into De Pucci to make it more aristocratic, and of a German bearing the genuinely aristocratic name of von Lanschafshausen, who changed it to a typically English name because the latter seemed more distinguished to his neighbors. End footnote. This feeling, perhaps, accounted for a good many changes of surnames among Germans upon the entrance of the United States into the war. But in the majority of cases, of course, the changes so copiously reported example from Bielefelder to Banson, and from Pulvermacher to Pullman, were merely efforts at protective coloration. The immigrant, in a time of extraordinary suspicion and difficulty, tried to get rid of at least one handicap. Footnote. The effects of race antagonism upon language are still to be investigated. The etymology of slave indicates that the inquiry might yield interesting results. The word French, in English, is largely used to suggest sexual perversion. 
in german anything russian is barbarous and english education hints at flagellation the french for many years called a certain contraband appliance a capote anglaise but after the entente cordiale they changed the name to capote allemande the common english name to this day is french letter End footnote. this motive constantly appears among the jews who face an anti-semitism that is imperfectly concealed and may be expected to grow stronger hereafter once they have lost the faith of their fathers a phenomenon almost inevitable in the first native-born generation they shrink from all the disadvantages that go with jewishness and seek to conceal their origin or at all events to avoid making it unnecessarily noticeable to this end they modify the spelling of the more familiar jewish surnames turning levi into lui lut levit levin levine levi levi footnote the english jews usually change levi to lewis a substitute almost unknown in america they also change abraham to bremen and moses to moss End footnote. and even lever cohen into cone con con can coin and con Arons into errands and errands and solomon into salmon salomon and Solson. in the same way they shorten their long names changing wolfsheimer to wolf goldschmidt to gold and rosenblatt rosenthal rosenbaum rosennau rosenberg rosenbush rosenbloom rosenstein rosenheim and rosenfeld to rose like the germans they also seek refuge in translations more or less literal thus on the east side of new york blumenthal is often changed to bloomingdale schneider to taylor reichmann to richmond and schlachtfeld to warfield fiddler a common jewish name becomes harper so does pickler which is yiddish for drummer stolar which is a yiddish word borrowed from the russian signifying carpenter is often changed to carpenter lichtmann and lichtenstein become chandler mylach which is hebrew for king becomes king and so does belakson the strong tendency to seek english sounding equivalents for names of noticeably foreign origin changes share into sherman michel into mitchell rogowski into rogers kolinsky into collins rabinovich into robbins davidovich into davis moiseyev into macy or mason and jacobson jakobovich and jakobovsky into jackson this last change proceeds by way of a transient change to jake or jack as a nickname jacob is always abbreviated to one or the other on the east side yankelevich also becomes jackson for yankel is yiddish for jacob footnote for these observations of name changes among the jews i am indebted to abraham khan End footnote. among the immigrants of other stocks some extraordinarily radical changes in name are to be observed greek names of five and even eight syllables shrink to smith hungarian names that seem to be all consonants are reborn in such euphonious forms as martin and lacy i have encountered a gregory who was born grigurevich in serbia a huler who was born ulyaric a graves who descends from the fine old dutch family of skravenhag 
i once knew a man named lawton whose grandfather had been a lawton burger first he shed the burger and then he changed the spelling of lawton to make it fit the inevitable american mispronunciation there is again a family of dicks in the south whose ancestor was a schwetendieck apparently a dutch or low german name there is yet again a celebrated american artist of the bohemian patronymic of hrubka who has abandoned it for a surname which is common to all the teutonic languages and is hence easy for americans the italians probably because of the relations established by the catholic church often take irish names as they marry irish girls it is common to hear of an italian pugilist or politician named kelly or o'brien the process of change is often informal but even legally it is quite facile the naturalization act of june twenty ninth nineteen o six authorizes the court as a part of the naturalization of any alien to make an order changing his name this is frequently done when he receives his last papers sometimes if the newspapers are to be believed without his solicitation and even against his protest if the matter is overlooked at the time he may change his name later on like any other citizen by simple application to a court of record among names of anglo-saxon origin and names naturalized long before the earliest colonization one notes certain american peculiarities setting off the nomenclature of the united states from that of the mother country the relative infrequency of hyphenated names in america is familiar when they appear at all it is almost always in response to direct english influences again a number of english family names have undergone modification in the new world venable may serve as a specimen the form in england is almost invariably venables but in america the final s has been lost and every example of the name that i have been able to find in the leading american reference books is without it and where spellings have remained unchanged pronunciations have been frequently modified this is particularly noticeable in the south callow hill down there is commonly pronounced carol crenshaw is granger hawthorne horton hayward howard norsworthy nazary ironmonger munger Fahrenholt, fernall camp kemp buchanan bohannon drury droit enruti darby and taliaferro tolliver the english crown and shields pronounce every syllable of their name the american crown and shields commonly make it crunchel van shake an old new york name is pronounced von skoik a good many american jews aiming at a somewhat laborious refinement change the pronunciation of the terminal stein in their names so that it rhymes not with line but with bean thus in fashionable jewish circles there are no longer any epsteins goldsteins and hammersteins but only epsteins goldsteins and hammersteins the american jews differ further from the english in pronouncing levy to make the first syllable rhyme with t the english jews always make the name levy to match such american prodigies as darby for enruti the english themselves have hools for howls sillinger for saint leger singin for saint john pool for powell weems for wemis kerduggan for cadigan mobrer for marlborough key for canes marchbanks for marjorabanks beecham for beauchamp chumley for chalmondley trossley for trotter's cliff and darby for derby 
not to mention maudlin for magdalen end of chapter eight part one recording by linda johnson chapter eight part two of the american language this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the american language by h l mencken chapter eight proper names in america part two given names the non-anglo-saxon american's willingness to anglicize his patronymic is far exceeded by his eagerness to give american baptismal names to his children the favorite given names of the old country almost disappear in the first native-born generation the irish immigrants quickly dropped such names as terence dennis and patrick and adopted in their places the less conspicuous john george and william the germans in the same way abandoned otto august hermann ludwig heinrich wolfgang albrecht wilhelm kurt hans rudolf gottlieb johann and franz for some of these they substituted the english equivalents charles louis henry william john frank and so on in the room of others they began afflicting their offspring with more fanciful native names milton and raymond were their chief favorites thirty or forty years ago footnote the one given name that they have clung to is carl this in fact has been adopted by americans of other stocks always however spelled c a r l such combinations as carl gray carl williams and even carl murphy are common here intermarriage has doubtless had its effect End footnote. the jews carry the thing to great lengths at present they seem to take most delight in sydney irving milton roy stanley and monroe but they also call their sons john charles henry harold william richard james albert edward alfred frederick thomas and even mark luke and matthew and their daughters mary gertrude estelle pauline alice and edith as a boy i went to school with many jewish boys the commonest given names among them were isidore samuel jonas isaac and israel these are seldom bestowed by the rabbis of today. in the same school were a good many german pupils boy and girl some of the girls bore such fine old german given names as katharina wilhelmina elsa lotta ermentrude and franziska all these have begun to disappear the newer immigrants indeed do not wait for the birth of their children to demonstrate their naturalization they change their own given names immediately they land i'm told by abraham khan that this is done almost universally on the east side of new york even the most old-fashioned jews immigrating to this country he says change yosel to joseph yankel to jacob liebel to louis fievel to philip itzik to isaac Ruven to robert and Moisey, or Motl, to Morris. Moreover, the spelling of Morris, as the position of its bearer improves, commonly changes to Maurice, though the pronunciation may remain Morus, as in the case of Mr. Perlmutter. The immigrants of other stocks follow the same habit. Every Bohemian Vaklav or Vostjek becomes a William. Every Yaroslav becomes a Jerry every bronislav a barney and every stanislav a stanley the italians run to frank and joe so do the hungarians and the balkan peoples 
the russians quickly drop their national system of nomenclature and give their children names according to the american plan even the chinese laundrymen of the big cities become john george charlie and frank i once encountered one boasting the name of emile the puritan influence in names as in ideas has remained a good deal more potent in american than in england the given name of the celebrated praise god barebones marked a fashion which died out in england very quickly but one still finds traces of it in america for example in such women's names as faith hope prudence charity and mercy and in such men's names as peregrine the religious obsession of the new england colonists is also kept in mind by the persistence of biblical names ezra hiram ezekiel zachariah elijah elihu and so on these names excite the derision of the english an american comic character in an english play or novel always bears one of them again the fashion of using surnames as given names is far more widespread in america than in england in this country indeed it takes on the character of a national habit fully three out of four eldest sons in families of any consideration bear their mothers surnames as middle names this fashion arose in england during the seventeenth century and one of its fruits was the adoption of such well-known surnames as stanley cecil howard douglas and duncan as common given names it died out over there during the eighteenth century and to-day the great majority of englishmen bear such simple given names as john charles and william often four or five of them but in america it has persisted a glance at a roster of the presidents of the united states will show how firmly it has taken root of the ten that have had middle names at all six have had middle names that were family surnames and two of the six have dropped their other given names and used these surnames this custom perhaps has paved the way for another that of making given names of any proper nouns that happen to strike the fancy thus general sherman was named after an indian chief tecumseh and a chicago judge was baptized Kennesaw Mountain. Footnote. The Geographic Board has lately decided that Kennesaw should be Kennesaw, K-E-N-N-E-S-A-W, but the learned jurist sticks to one N. End footnote. In memory of the battle that General Sherman fought there, a late candidate for governor of New York had the curious given name of D. Cady, footnote thornton reprints a paragraph from the congressional globe of june fifteenth eighteen fifty four alleging that in eighteen forty six during the row over the oregon boundary when fifty four forty or fight was a political slogan many canal boats and even some of the babies were christened fifty four forty end footnote various familiar american given names originally surnames are almost unknown in england among them washington jefferson jackson lincoln columbus and lee chauncey forms a curious addition to the list it was the surname of the second president of harvard college and was bestowed upon their offspring by numbers of his graduates it then got into general use and acquired a typically American pronunciation, with the A of the first syllable flat. It is never encountered in England. In the pronunciation of various given names, as in that of many surnames, English and American usages differ. Evelyn, in England, is given two syllables instead of three, and the first is made to rhyme with leave. Irene is given two syllables, making it Irene. Ralph is pronounced Rafe. Jerome is accented on the first syllable. In America, it is always accented on the second. Footnote. 
the irish present several curious variations thus they divide charles into two syllables they also take liberties with various english surnames birmingham for example is pronounced brimmingham in ireland End footnote. End of chapter eight, part two. Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter eight, part three of the American language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American language by h l mencken chapter eight proper names in america part three geographical names there is no part of the world said robert louis stevenson where nomenclature is so rich poetical humorous and picturesque as in the united states of america a glance at the latest united states official postal guide or report of the United States Geographical Board, quite bears out this opinion. The map of the country is besprinkled with place names from at least half a hundred languages, living and dead, and among them one finds examples of the most daring and elaborate fancy. There are Spanish, French, and Indian names as melodious and charming as running water. There are names out of the histories and mythologies of all the great races of man. There are names grotesque and names almost sublime. No other country can match them for interest and variety. When there arises among us a philologist who will study them as thoroughly and intelligently as the Swiss Johann Jakob Eagli studied the place names of Central Europe, his work will be an invaluable contribution to the history of the nation, and no less to an understanding of the psychology of its people. The original English settlers, it would appear, displayed little imagination in naming the new settlements and natural features of the land that they came to. Their almost invariable tendency at the start was to make use of names familiar at home, or to invent banal compounds. Plymouth Rock at the north and Jamestown at the south are examples of their poverty of fancy. They filled the narrow tract along the coast with New Bostons, Cambridges, Bristols, and Londons, and often used the adjective as a prefix. But this was only in the days of the beginning. Once they had begun to move back from the coast and to come into contact with the Aborigines, and with the widely dispersed settlers of other races, they encountered rivers, mountains, lakes, and even towns that bore far more engaging names, and these, after some resistance, they perforce adopted. The native names of such rivers as the James, the York, and the Charles succumbed, but those of the Potomac, the Patapsco, the Merrimack, and the Penobscot survived and they were gradually reinforced as the country was penetrated. Most of the Indian names, in getting upon the early maps, suffered somewhat severe simplifications. Potawanmiak was reduced to Potomac, P-O-T-O-M-A-C-K, and then to Potomac, P-O-T-O-M-A-C. Uniacara became Niagara. Rikawakis by the law of Hobson Jobson, was turned into Rockaway, and Pentapong into Port Tobacco. But despite such elisions and transformations, the charm of thousands of them remained, and today they are responsible for much of the characteristic color of American geographical nomenclature. Such names as Tallahassee, Susquehanna, Mississippi, Allegheny, Chicago, Kennebec, Patuxent and Arkansas give a barbaric brilliancy to the American map. Only the map of Australia, with its mellifluous Maori names, can match it. The settlement of the American continent 
once the eastern coast ranges were crossed, proceeded with unparalleled speed. And so the naming of the new rivers, lakes, peaks, and valleys, and of the new towns and districts, no less strained the inventiveness of the pioneers. The result is the vast duplication of names that shows itself in the postal guide. No less than eighteen imitative Bostons and New Bostons still appear, and there are nineteen Bristols, twenty-eight Newports, and twenty-two Londons and New Londons. Argonauts, starting out from an older settlement on the coast, would take its name with them, and so we find Philadelphias in Illinois, Mississippi, Missouri, and Tennessee, Richmond's in Iowa, Kansas, and nine other western states, and Princeton's in fifteen. Even when a new name was hit upon, it seems to have been hit upon simultaneously by scores of scattered bands of settlers. Thus we find the whole land bespattered with Washingtons, Lafayettes, Jeffersons, and Jacksons, and with names suggested by common and obvious natural objects, for example, Bear Creek, Bold Knob, and Buffalo. The Geographic Board, in its last report, made a belated protest against the successive duplication. The names Elk, Beaver, Cottonwood, and Bald, it said, were altogether too numerous. Of post offices alone, there are fully a hundred embodying elk. Counting in rivers, lakes, creeks, mountains, and valleys, the map of the United States probably shows at least twice as many such names. A study of American geographical and place names reveals eight general classes as follows. A. Those embodying personal names chiefly the surnames of pioneers or of national heroes. b. Those transferred from other and older places, either in the eastern states or in Europe. c. Indian names. d. Dutch, Spanish, and French names. e. Biblical and mythological names. f. Names descriptive of localities. g. Names suggested by the local flora fauna or geology h purely fanciful names the names of the first class are perhaps the most numerous some consist of surnames standing alone as washington cleveland bismarck lafayette taylor and randolph others consist of surnames in combination with various old and new grundwörter as pittsburgh knoxville daily switch hagerstown Franklinton, Dodge City, Fort Riley, Wayne Junction, and McKeesport. And yet others are contrived of given names, either alone or in combination, as Louisville, St. Paul, Elizabeth, Johnstown, Charlotte, Williamsburg, and Marysville. The number of towns in the United States bearing women's given names is enormous. I find, for example, eleven post offices called Charlotte, ten called Ada, and no less than nineteen called Alma. Most of these places are small, but there is an Elizabeth with 75,000 population, and Elmira with 40,000, and an Augusta with nearly 45,000. The names of the second class we have already briefly observed. They are betrayed in many cases by the prefix new. More than 600 such post offices are recorded, ranging from New Albany to New Windsor. Others bear such prefixes as West, North, and South, or various distinguishing affixes, for example, Bostonia, Pittsburgh Landing, Yorktown, and Hartford City. One often finds eastern county names applied to western towns, and eastern town names applied to western rivers and mountains. Thus, Cambria, which is the name of a county but not of a post office in Pennsylvania, is a town name in seven western states. Baltimore is the name of a glacier in Alaska, and Princeton is the name of a peak in Colorado. 
in the same way the names of the more easterly states often reappear in the west for example in mount ohio colorado delaware oklahoma and virginia city nevada the tendency to name small american towns after the great capitals of antiquity has excited the derision of the english since the early days there is scarcely an english book upon the states without some fling at it of late it has fallen into abeyance though sixteen athenses still remain and there are yet many carthages uticas syracuse romes alexandrias ninevehs and troys the third city of the nation philadelphia got its name from the ancient stronghold of philadelphus of pergamon to make up for the falling off of this old and flamboyant custom the more recent immigrants have brought with them the names of the capitals and other great cities of their fatherlands thus the american map bristles with berlins bremens hamburgs warsaws and leipzigs and is beginning to show stockholms venices belgrades and christianas the influence of indian names upon american nomenclature is quickly shown by a glance at the map no less than twenty-six of the states have names borrowed from the aborigines and the same thing is true of most of our rivers and mountains there was an effort at one time to get rid of these indian names thus the early virginians changed the name of powhatan to the james and the first settlers of new york changed the name of Horicon to Lake George. In the same way, the present name of the White Mountains displaced Agiochuk, and New Amsterdam and later New York displaced Manhattan, which has been recently revived. The law of Hobson Jobson made changes in other Indian names, sometimes complete and sometimes only partial. Thus, Mawawaming, became Wyoming. Mokwachung became Mochchunk. Obichi became Wabish. A Sing Sing became Sing Sing. And Machahiganing became Michigan. But this vandalism did not go far enough to take away the brilliant color of the aboriginal nomenclature. The second city of the United States bears an Indian name, and so do the largest American river, and the greatest American waterfall, and four of the five great lakes, and the scene of the most important military decision ever reached on American soil. The Dutch place names of the United States are chiefly confined to the vicinity of New York, and a good many of them have become greatly corrupted. Brooklyn, Wallabout, and Gramercy often examples. The first name was originally Brickelen, the second was Vala Bopt, and the third was Dikromadzi. Hellgate is a crude translation of the Dutch Hellegat. During the early part of the last century, the more delicate New Yorkers transformed the term into Hellgate, but the change was vigorously opposed by Washington Irving and so hellgate was revived the law of hobson jobson early converted the dutch hook into hook and it survives in various place names for example kinderhook and sandy hook the dutch kill is a grunvert in many other names for example catskill skykill peekskill fishkill and kill van Kull. it is the equivalent of the american creek Many other Dutch place names will come familiarly to mind. Harlem, Staten, Flushing, Cortland, Culverplot, Nassau, Conties, Spuyten Duyvel, Yonkers, Hoboken, and Bowery from Bouverie. Block Island was originally Block, B-L-O-K, and Cape May, according to Shelley de Vere, was May. M E Y, both Dutch. A large number of New York street and neighborhood names come down from Knickerbocker days, 
and often greatly changed in pronunciation. De Brosses offers an example. The Dutch called it De Brusse, but in New York today it is commonly spoken of as Des Brosses. French place names have suffered almost as severely. Few persons would recognize Smackover, the name of a small town in Arkansas, as French, and yet in its original form, Chemin Couvert. Shelley Duvier, in 1871, recorded the degeneration of the name to Smack Cover. The post office, always eager to shorten and simplify names, has since made one word of it and got rid of the redundant C. In the same way, Bob Rooley, a Missouri name, descends from Boy Brule. The American tongue, says W. W. Crane, seems to lend itself reluctantly to the words of alien languages. Footnote. It will be recalled how Pignot, the French perfumer, was compelled to place advertisements in the streetcars instructing the public in the proper pronunciation of his name. End footnote. This is shown plainly by the history of French place names among us. A large number of them, for example, La Supérieure, was translated into English at an early day, and most of those that remain are now pronounced as if they were English. Thus, Des Moines is Des Moines. Terhout is Terry Hot. Beaufort is Beaufort. New Orleans is Orleans. Lafayette has a flat A. Hors du Gras has another. And Versailles is Versailles. The pronunciation of Saul in Saul Saint Marie is commonly more or less correct. The Minneapolis Saint Paul and Saul Saint Marie Railroad is popularly called the Sioux. This may be due to Canadian example or to some confusion between Saw and Sioux, S I O U X. The French Louis in Saint Louis and Louisville is usually pronounced correctly. So is the Rouge in Baton Rouge, though the Baton is commonly boggled. It is possible that familiarity with Saint Louis influenced the local pronunciation of Illinois, which is Illinois, but this may be a mere attempt to improve upon the vulgar Illini. Footnote. The same compromise is apparent in the pronunciation of Iroquois, which is Iroquois, quite as often as it is Iroquois, with an S. End of footnote. For a number of years, the Geographic Board has been seeking vainly to re-establish the correct pronunciation of the name of the Purgatoire River in Colorado. Originally named the Rio de la Animas by the Spaniards, it was renamed the Riviere du Purgatoire by their French successors. The American pioneers changed this to Picketwire, and that remains the local name of the stream to this day, despite the effort of the Geographic Board to compromise on Purgatory River. Many other French names are being anglicized with its aid and consent. Already half a dozen Bellevues, B-E-L-L-E-V-U-E-S, have been changed to Bellevues, B-E-L-L-E-V-I-E-W-S, and Bellevues, B-E-L-L-V-I-E-W-S, and the spelling of the nearly all the Belvedere's, B E L V accented e v accented e r e s has been changed to belvedere b e l v i d e r e bel air louisiana represents the end product of a process of decay which began with bel air b e l l e capital a i r e and then proceeded to bel air and bel air b e l l a i r e and b e l l AIR, respectively. All these forms are still to be found together with Bel Air. B E L, capital A I R. 
to geographic boards antipathy to accented letters and to names of more than one word has converted isle st therese in the st lawrence river to isle st therese a truly abominable barbarism and lasigne in kansas to lasigne which is even worse le moyne la belle la grange and lamont are among its other improvements lafayette for la fayette long antedates the beginning of its labors the spanish names of the southwest are undergoing a like process of corruption though without official aid san antonio has been changed to san anton in popular pronunciation and seems likely to go to santon el paso has acquired a flat american a and a z sound in place of the spanish s los angeles presents such difficulties that no two of its inhabitants agree upon the proper pronunciation and many compromise on simple loss as the folks of jacksonville commonly call their town jacks some of the most mellifluous of american place names are in the areas once held by the spaniards it would be hard to match the beauty of santa margarita san anselmo alamogordo terra amarilla sabinoso las palomas ensenada nogales san patricio and bernalillo but they are under a severe and double assault not only do the present lords of the soil debase them in speaking them in many cases they are formally displaced by native names of the utmost harshness and banality thus one finds in new mexico such absurdly named towns as sugarite shoemaker new hope lordsburg eastview and central in arizona such places as old glory springerville wickenburg and congress junction and even in california such abominations as oakhurst ben hur dry town skidoo susanville uno and ono the early spaniards were prodigal with place names testifying to their piety but these names in the overwhelming main were those of saints add salvador trinidad and concepcion and their repertoire is almost exhausted if they ever named a town jesus the name had been obliterated by anglo-saxon prudery even their use of the name as a personal appellation violates american notions of the fitting the names of the jewish patriarchs and those of the holy places in palestine do not appear among their place names their christianity seems to have been exclusively of the new testament but the americans who displaced them were intimately familiar with both books of the bible and one finds copious proofs of it on the map of the united states there are no less than seven bethlehems in the postal guide and the name is also applied to various mountains and to one of the reaches of the ohio river i find thirteen bethanies seventeen bethels eleven beulahs nine canons eleven jordans and twenty-one sharons adam is sponsor for a town in west virginia and an island in the chesapeake and eve for a village in kentucky there are five post offices named aaron two named abraham two named job and a town and a lake named moses most of the st paul's and st joseph's of the country were inherited from the french but the two st patrick's show a later influence eight wesleys and wesleyvilles eight asbury's and twelve names embodying luther indicate the general theological trend of the plain people there is a village in maryland too small to have a post office named gott and i find gott's island in maine and gottville in california 
but no doubt these were named after German settlers of that awful name, and not after the Lord God directly. There are four trinities, to say nothing of the inherited Spanish trinidads. Names wholly or partly descriptive of localities are very numerous throughout the country, and among the Grundwörter embodied in them are terms highly characteristic of America, and almost unknown to the English vocabulary. Bald knob would puzzle an Englishman, but the name is so common in the United States that the Geographic Board has had to take measures against it. Others of that sort are Council Bluffs, Patapsco Neck, Delaware Water Gap, Curtis Creek, Walden Pond, Sandy Hook, Key West, Bull Run, Portage, French Lick, Jones Gulch, Watkins Gully, Cedar Bayou, Keams Canyon, Parker Notch, Sucker Branch, Frazier's Bottom, and Eagle Pass. Butt Creek in Montana is a name made up of two Americanisms. There are 35 post offices whose names embody the word prairie. Several of them, for example, Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, inherited from the French. There are seven divides, eight butts, eight town names embodying the word burnt, innumerable names embodying grove, barren, plain, fork, center, crossroads, courthouse, cove, and ferry, and a great swarm of cold springs, cold waters, summits, middle towns, and highlands. The flora and fauna of the land are enormously represented. There are 22 buffaloes beside the city in New York, and scores of buffalo creeks, ridges, springs, and wallows. The elks, in various forms, are still more numerous, and there are dozens of towns, mountains, lakes, creeks, and country districts named after the beaver, marten, coyote, moose, and otter, and as many more named after such characteristic flora as the pawpaw, the sycamore, the cottonwood, the locust, and the sunflower. There is an alligator in Mississippi, a crawfish in Kentucky, and a rat lake on the Canadian border of Minnesota. The endless search for mineral wealth has besprinkled the map with such names as bromide, oil city, anthracite, chrome, chloride, coal run, goldfield, telluride, leadville, and cement. There was a time, particularly during the gold rush to California, when the rough humor of the country showed itself in the invention of extravagant and often highly felicitous place names. But with the growth of population and the rise of civic spirit, they have tended to be replaced with more seemly coinages. Catfish Creek in Wisconsin is now the Ahara River. The Bulldog Mountains in Arizona have become the Hirosomas. The Picket Wire River, as we have seen, has resumed its old French name of Purgatoire. As with natural features of the landscape, so with towns. Nearly all the old Boozevilles, Jackass Flats, Three Fingers, Hell Fasartanes, Undershirt Hills, Razzle Dazzles, Cow Tails, Yellow Dogs, Jim Jamses, Jump Offs, Poker Cities, and Skunk Towns have yielded to the growth of delicacy. But Tombstone still stands in Arizona. Gooseville remains a post office in Montana, and the Geographic Board gives its imprimatur to the Horse Thief Trail in Colorado, to Burning Bear Creek in the same state, and to Pig Eye Lake in Minnesota. Various other survivors of a more lively and innocent day linger on the map. Blue Ball, Arkansas, Cowhide, West Virginia, Dollarville, Michigan, Oven Fork, Kentucky, Social Circle, Georgia, Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, Bubble, Arkansas, 
Shy Beaver, Pennsylvania. Shin Pond, Maine. Rough and Ready, California. Non Intervention, Virginia. Noodle, Texas. Nursery, Missouri. Number 4, New York. Oblong, Illinois. Stockyard, Nebraska. Stout, Iowa, and so on. West Virginia, the wildest of the eastern states, is full of such place names. Among them I find Affinity, Anamoria, Anna Maria, B, Bias, Big Chimney, Billy, Blue Jay, Bulltown, Caress, Cinderella, Cyclone, Czar, Cornstalk, Duck, Halcyon, Jingo, Left Hand, Raven's Eye, Six, Skull Run, Three Churches, Unita, Wide Mouth, War Eagle, and Stumptown. The postal guide shows two Ben Hurs, five St. Elmos, and ten Ivanhoes, but only one Middle March. There are seventeen Roosevelts, six Cody's, and six Barnums, but no Shakespeare. Washington, of course, is the most popular of American place names, but among names of post offices, it is hard pushed by Clinton, Centerville, Liberty, Canton, Marion, and Madison, and even by Springfield, Warren, and Bismarck. The Geographic Board, in its laudable effort to simplify American nomenclature, has played ducks and drakes with some of the most picturesque names on the national map. Now and then, as in the case of Purgatoire, it has temporarily departed from this policy, but in the main its influence has been thrown against the fine old French and Spanish names, and against the more piquant native names, no less. Thus, I find it, deciding against Portage de Flacon, and in favor of the hideous Bottle Portage, against Canada del Burro, and in favor of Burro Canyon, against Canos y las de la Cruz, and in favor of the barbarous Cruz Island. In Borgia Landing, in Canyon City, it has deleted the accents. The name of the De Grasse River, it has changed to Grass. De Law it has changed to the intolerable De Law, and as we have seen, it has steadily amalgamated French and Spanish articles with their nouns, thus achieving such forms as Duchesne, El Dorado, Dillion, and La Harpe. But here its policy is fortunately inconsistent, and so a number of fine old names has escaped. Thus it has decided in favor of Bon Secure, and against Bon Seckers, and in favor of De Soto, La Crosse, and La More, and against De Soto, La Crosse, and La More. Here its decisions are confused and often unintelligible. Why La Porte, Pennsylvania, and La Porte, Iowa? Why Lagrange, Indiana, and Lagrange, Kentucky. Here it would seem to be yielding a great deal too much to local usage. The board proceeds to the shortening and simplification of native names by various devices. It deletes such suffixes as town, city, and courthouse. It removes the apostrophe and often the genitive s from such names as St. Mary's. It shortens Berg, B-U-G-R-H, to B-U-R-G, and Burrow, B-O-R-O-U-G-H, to B-O-R-O, -O, and it combines separate and often highly discreet words. The last habit often produces grotesque forms. For example, New Berlin, Box Elder, Sabbath Day Lake, Fallen Timber, Blue Mountain. West Town, Three Pines, and Mission Hill. It apparently cherishes a hope of eventually regularizing the spelling of Allegheny. This is now A-L-L-E-G-A-N-Y for the Maryland County, the Pennsylvania Township, and the New York and Oregon Towns. A-L-L-E-G-H-A-N-Y for the Mountains. The Colorado Town, and the Virginia Town and Springs, and 
Allegheny, A-L-L-E-G-H-E-N-Y, for the Pittsburgh Borough and the Pennsylvania County College and River. The board inclines to Allegheny, with the H and the E, for both river and mountains. Other Indian names give it constant concern. It struggles to set up Kemquasa Bamtikuk as the name of a main lake, in place of Kemquasa Bamtik and Kemquasa Bamtikuk with two S's, and Chattahospi as the name of an Alabama creek in place of Chattahospi with two T's. Hulithloco, Hulithlokis, Hulithloco with one C, and Hutithloco with two C's, are worthy of its learning and authority. Footnote. The Geographic Board is composed of representatives of the Coast and Geodetic Survey, the Geological Survey, the General Land Office, the Post Office, the Forest Service, the Smithsonian Institution, the Biological Survey, the Government Printing Office, the Census and Lighthouse Bureaus, the General Staff of the Army, the Hydrographic Office, Library and War Records Office of the Navy, the Treasury, and the Department of State. It was created by executive order September 4, 1890, and its decisions are binding upon all federal officials. It has made to date about 15,000 decisions. They are recorded in reports issued at irregular intervals and in more frequent bulletins. End of footnote. The American tendency to pronounce all the syllables of a word more distinctly than the English, shows itself in geographical names. White, in 1880, recorded the increasing habit of giving full value to the syllables of such borrowed English names as Worcester and Warwick. I have frequently noted the same thing. In Worcester County, Maryland, the name is usually pronounced Worcester, but on the western shore of the state, one hears Worcester. Footnote. I have often noted that Americans, in speaking of the familiar Worcestershire sauce, commonly pronounce every syllable and enunciated shire distinctly. In England, it is always Worcestershire. End of footnote. Norwich is another such name. One hears Norwich quite as often as Norwich. Footnote. The English have a great number of such decayed pronunciations. For example, Magdalen for Magdalen College. Sister for Serenchester. Marybone for Marylebone. Their geographical nomenclature shows many corruptions due to faulty pronunciation and the law of Hobson Jobson. For example, Leighton Buzzard for the Norman French Leighton Beau de Sart. End of footnote. Yet another is Delhi. One often hears Delhi. White said that in his youth the name of the Shawangunk Mountains in New York was pronounced Shongo, but that the custom of pronouncing it as spelled had arisen during his manhood. So with Winnipesaukee, the name of a lake, or Winnipesaukee. It gradually came to be pronounced as spelled. There is frequently a considerable difference between the pronunciation of a name by natives of a place and its pronunciation by those who are familiar with it only in print. Baltimore offers an example. The natives always drop the medial I and so reduce the name to two syllables. The habit identifies them. Anne Arundel, the name of a county in Maryland, is usually pronounced Anne Runnel by its people. Arkansas, as everyone knows, is pronounced Arkansas by the Arkansans. And the Nevadans give the name of their state a flat A. The local pronunciation of Illinois I have already noticed. Iowa at home is often Iowa. Footnote, curiously enough, Americans always use the broad A in the first syllable of Albany, whereas Englishmen rhyme the syllable with pal. The English also pronounce pal-mal as if it were spelt P 
P-A-L-M-A-L. Americans commonly give it two broad A's. End of footnote. Many American geographical names offer great difficulty to Englishmen. One of my English acquaintances tells me that he was taught at school to accent Massachusetts on the second syllable, to rhyme the second syllable of Ohio with T, and to sound the first C in Connecticut. In Maryland, the name of Calvert County is given a broad A, whereas the name of Calvert Street in Baltimore as a flat A. This curious distinction is almost always kept up. A Scotchman coming to America would give the CH in such names as Loch Raven and Loch Vale the guttural Scotch and German sound, but locally it is always pronounced as if it were a K. Finally, there is a curious difference between English and American usage in the use of the word river. The English invariably put it before the proper name, whereas we almost as invariably put it after. The Thames River would seem quite as strange to an Englishman as the River Chicago would seem to us. This difference arose more than a century ago and was noticed by Pickering, but in his day the American usage was still somewhat uncertain, and such forms as the River Mississippi were yet in use. Today, river almost always goes after the proper name. End of chapter 8, part 3。Chapter 8, part 4 of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 8. Proper Names in America, Part 4. Street Names. Such a locality as the corner of Avenue H and 23rd Street, says W. W. Crane, is about as distinctively American as Algonquin and Iroquois names like Mississippi and Saratoga. Kipling, in his American Notes, gives testimony to the strangeness with which the number names, the phrase the corner of, and the custom of omitting street, fall upon the ear of a Britisher. He quotes with amazement certain directions given to him on his arrival in San Francisco from India. Go six blocks north to the corner of Geary and Markey. Market. Then walk around till you strike the corner of gutter and sixteenth the english always add the word street or road or place or avenue when speaking of a thoroughfare such a phrase as oxford and new bond would strike them as incongruous the american custom of numbering and lettering streets is almost always ascribed by english writers who discuss it not to a desire to make finding them easy but to sheer poverty of invention the English apparently have an inexhaustible fund of names for streets. They often give one street more than one name. Thus, Oxford Street, London, becomes the Bayswater Road, High Street, Holland Park Avenue, Goldhawk Road, and finally the Oxford Road to the westward, and High Holborn, Holborn Viaduct, Newgate Street, Cheapside, The Poultry, Cornhill, and Leadenhall Street to the eastward. The Strand, in the same way, becomes Fleet Street, Ludgate Hill, and Cannon Street. Nevertheless, there is a First Avenue in Queen's Park, and parallel to it are Second, Third, Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Avenues, all small streets leading northward from the Harrow Road, just east of Kensal Green Cemetery. I have observed that few Londoners have ever heard of them. There is also a First Street in Chelsea, a very modest thoroughfare near Lennox Gardens and not far from the Brompton Oratory. Next to the numbering and lettering of streets, a fashion apparently set up by Major Pierre Charles L'Enfant's plans for Washington, 
the most noticeable feature of american street nomenclature as opposed to that of england is the extensive use of such designations as avenue boulevard drive and speedway avenue is used in england but only rather sparingly it is seldom applied to a mean street or to one in a warehouse district in america the word is scarcely distinguished in meaning from street footnote there are of course local exceptions in baltimore for example avenue used to be reserved for wide streets in the suburbs thus charles street on passing the old city boundary became charles street avenue further out it became the charles street avenue road probably a unique triplication but that was years ago of late many fifth-rate streets in baltimore have been changed into avenues End footnote. boulevard drive and speedway are almost unknown to the english but they use road for urban thoroughfares which is very seldom done in america and they also make free use of place walk passage lane and circus all of which are obsolescent on this side of the ocean some of the older american cities such as boston and baltimore have surviving certain ancient english designations of streets example cheapside and cornhill these are unknown in the newer american towns broadway which is also english is more common many american towns now have plazas which are unknown in england nearly all have city hall parks squares or places city hall is also unknown over there the principal street of a small town in america is almost always main street in england it is as invariably high street usually with the definite article before high i have mentioned the corruption of old dutch street and neighborhood names in new york spanish names are corrupted in the same way in the southwest and french names in the great lakes region and in louisiana in new orleans the street names many of them strikingly beautiful are pronounced so barbarously by the people that a frenchman would have difficulty recognizing them thus bourbon has become bourbon dauphin is dauphin foucher is foucher enguin is enguin and felicity originally felicite is fill a city the french in their days bestowed the names of the muses upon certain of the city streets they are now pronounced calliope terpsichore melpomene uterp and so on bon enfant apparently too difficult for the native has been translated into good children only esplanade and bagatelle among the french street names of the city seem to be commonly pronounced with any approach to correctness end of chapter eight part four recording by linda johnson